Football Convos number five, Joel Corey. Be persistent because if you want to get in the eight, if you want to become a sports agent, it's a highly competitive industry. For daily conversations with the players, coaches, and contributors that make this game great. Regulators, mount up. We're coming. Football Convos. Here's your host, Andy Carlson. Very happy to be joined now on Football Convos by Joel Corey. He's on the Twitter machine, at Corey. Joel, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing fine. How about yourself? Uh, pretty good. Now, were you mad at all that you couldn't get the Twitter handle Joel Corey? Because I just looked it up, and it's like some bodybuilder dude or something like that. Yeah, I was a little surprised by that because I don't have a common first or last name, <laughs> So I didn't think that anyone would have it, and I did what you did. I Googled to see who had it or if there was another Joel Corey, and I'm definitely not a DJ. So <laughs> I just uh, tried to do my best, reversed it, and I've been going with that. All right, Joel Corey, not the DJ, but he is a former sports agent and now a writer for National Football Post as well as CBS Sports, focusing on contracts and the salary cap. Now, uh, what's the first reaction or the first question that people give you when they find out you used to be an agent? First thing they ask is, why are you a former agent? Mm. And what do you answer to that? Well, uh, sometimes I'll say that I got tired of being a professional babysitter, and that mm. reaction will get like, what do you mean by that? <laughs> and Because that's how I sometimes used to explain what I did when I was an agent. I'd say professional babysitter, and people wouldn't get it until I would tell them that there's a lot of hand-holding and a lot of babysitting going on because uh, you're dealing with some athletes, not all, that can be very self-absorbed, mm -hmm. uh, very uh, self-entitled, and not really have a concept of anybody else's time. Mm -hmm. Not all athletes are like that, but the ones like that are, are ones that you don't particularly enjoy working with. <laughs> now, not, not to name names, but uh, uh, give me a little story. Give me an example of that. What's the worst case you do, you've ever had to deal with? Uh, I don't know about worst case, but there was a, one situation where we had set up a commercial on the players' off days, Tuesdays, mm -hmm. uh, for a, a regional fast food uh chain and the player calls Monday night and we've been working to set this up to get them interested for several months finally get everything finalized sign a deal and part of the deal was commercial that Monday night he's like I don't want to do it oh. <laughs> like, whoa wait a minute what do you what do you mean you don't want to do it so it took a lot of convincing to turn him around <laughs> to get him to uh be the commercial because <laughs> could you imagine what would have happened in the recourses mm -hmm. of him canceling at the last minute because they still have to pay for the crew <laughs> yep. and everything he would never get another commercial <laughs> with this company and it would reflect poorly on us so that was one of those times it was on the east coast where I <laughs> didn't sleep well and was half expecting a call because I had a very early East Coast call time in the middle of the night. Where is so-and-so? Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I didn't get it, but you know, situations like that that can be very stressful that you didn't really want to – I didn't particularly enjoy dealing with. Now, professional babysitter, that I guess that fits that to a T. Oh, no doubt. Yeah. Now – do you ever get a lot of Jerry Maguire questions, or how, how many times have you ever heard "Show me the money" in your life? Uh, I wish I had a dollar for every time I've heard that. <laughs> That's because uh, because what because that was what another way I would reference what I do after the movie came out. I go sports agent, and some people didn't get it. I go Jerry Maguire. Like, oh, okay. But I've also gotten the question: Is what you did like Jerry Maguire and? To me, the, the movie does have some realism in it, but it lost me early on mm -hmm. because from what I remember, I haven't seen the movie in a long time, um, Jerry Maguire was the point person for multiple guys in the movie, mm -hmm. and I guess, who was it, Jay Morris category uh, uh, character, Bob Sugar. Bob Sugar. Uh, yeah, love, love that name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wasn't the one who was the point person, and typically – 
you wouldn't fire. Well, actually, it just really happened in real life of Ben Dogger. But typically, you don't fire the guy who is the point person for a, a lot of clients because what's going to happen is the person who has the relationship with the clients is the one who ends up representing the clients. So Jerry, in the real world, Jerry McGuire would have worked with a lot more clients than just Rod Tidwell, mm-hmm. and there may or may not have been a covenant not to compete which may or may not be enforceable depending upon what state. So it would have been a movie with a lot of lawyers involved and for a whole lot of litigation if that part had been accurate, which would have changed the whole movie. Uh, that would have been a lot more boring movie. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> but I had a hard time putting getting past that one hurdle. Mm-hmm. So I don't necessarily view the movie the way a lot of a lot of people do. Let's see. My, my favorite thing about the movie is how dated it is now in that Rod getting that, was it four-year, $11 million deal at the end was a blockbuster deal back in the day? Oh, yeah. Yeah, times have changed. That was, what, the mid-'90s in that movie came Yeah, yeah. Out? And now, now, like, the fourth wide receiver on the team is getting that sort of money. Yeah, if, you, if you're getting excited about getting a guy $11 million over four years, either you're right, he's a fourth of this re- receiver or he's an aging receiver trying to hang on and some team just signed him to a deal stretched out for four years for salary cap purposes. Yeah. And as always, what's the guaranteed number? There you go. Yeah, that, that's one thing that's kind of changed over the years is the people become more savvy with the salary cap because then it, at it, its initial inception in the uh, early 90s, well, actually 93, 94, most people didn't focus so much on the guaranteed money. Teams or agents uh, went back and looked at some of those deals, some of the high-end deals back then. Guaranteed money was basically a signing bonus, and there really wasn't that much of it as the overall percentage of the, uh, the deal. That that's something that everyone focuses on now. So just the whole industry in terms of how uh, components of the deal are valued mm-hmm. is markedly different from early on in the salary cap. Now a lot of people always talk about how the NFL is one of the few leagues that doesn't have big guaranteed contracts. But if the players were going to fight for that in the next CBA, how much would they have to give up? It won't happen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they they first. In order to get guaranteed contracts, they would have to be prepared to sit out for an extremely long time, maybe longer than we've seen with the last two basketball lockouts. Mm -hmm. Football players don't have that type of resolve. So I don't think you're ever going to see fully guaranteed contracts in the NFL. And it's interesting that you should just bring up the whole concept. Um, Now, one of the deals I'm most proud of, I was the co-negotiator of John Randall's uh, five-year, $32.5 million deal in 1998, which made him the highest-paid defensive player. Mm-hmm. That deal contained $20 million in guarantees. Oh. Guarantees weren't structured like Colin Kaepernick's, mm-hmm. where they're actually year-to-year. It was like a $10 million signing bonus. Now, the guarantees after the first year, in years two and three, and year four vested – um, if he was on the roster after the first year, which is more like the guarantees you see for the quarterbacks. Um, at the time, there were several executives like Bill Polian and Ralph Wilson who said that this deal was going to ruin football because you can't have guaranteed contracts for football players because their effort is going to wane because of the violent nature of the sport. To me, mm-hmm. that's insulting to the individual. Because if it's a guy who takes pride in what he does, it's it's going to be irrelevant. But the, the uh, owners and team executives kind of took uh, the sky is falling approach to that deal. But it's kind of become the blueprint for a lot of uh, other contracts and how guarantees have become much more acceptable because signing bonus no longer is the predominant uh form of guaranteed money in NFL contracts. Mm-hmm. Uh, Johnny Randall, now you're talking my language as a Vikings fan. And he, he strikes me as the guy who would have given the same effort if he was making a dollar a game as if he was making you know, $150,000 a game. Exactly. He's the guy that before he was established, when he was trying to make a name for himself, veterans hated in practice because of the effort he gave. Mm-hmm. And then once he became established, he was the guy who raised the intensity level of practice because if your best defensive player and arguably your best player on the team is getting that type of effort, everyone else has to. 
and, and, the, and the one thing with him, everyone used to always, because of his on-field persona as a trash talker, would always ask, uh, I'd say he was one of the guys he represented, it would be, oh, I feel sorry for him. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm like, he's totally different off the field than he is on the field, which is the case you see with a lot of football players. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, Joel, I wanted to go back in time a little bit and get to the start of your uh, football football story. What did it all begin with you? Well, I originally knew I wanted to be an agent when I was in college at Emory. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't really know how I was going to achieve that goal, but figured if I go to law school, that's a nice fallback. So mm -hmm. I went to UCLA for law school. I took a sports law class, which changed my life. Um, my professor, I had, I got assigned in the class a uh, project, which was the fictitious negotiation of a Dodgers baseball player. It was mm -hmm. a cross between Jose Offerman and Steve Sachs. The professor had relationships with people in the industry, and the negotiator for the team side was Sam Fernandez, who at the time and may still be the Dodgers general counsel. Uh, Sam and my professor, Steve Darian, thought I did a really good job on the project. Steve's wife is an attorney and knew a sports agent that needed a summer intern. I already had a job lined up at a law firm that mm -hmm. was a pretty well-paying job for a summer associate. I ended up getting out of that to work for free um, as an intern at a sports agency. Mm -hmm. And I was told going in, because Steve recommended me that it was really no vetting process. It was basically if Steve says you're good enough, because um, the guy I ended up working with, Gary Uberstein, said he wanted the best student in, in, the, in, the cl in that class. And Steve, fortunately, um, recommended me. I was told from the very outset, this has no potential to advance outside of the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, being, I don't know, naive or the ignorance of youth, my internal thought, I didn't say it out loud, never verbalized, and it was, well, by the middle of the summer, that'll change. <laughs> I just figured if I worked real hard, maybe I'd impress them and they would want to offer me a job. It didn't happen immediately. It became during the middle of the summer, are you happy here? Do you want to uh, continue working uh, during your last year of school? Of course I did, and then in that fall semester, that turned into a job offer, mm -hmm. which I uh, ended up taking. And it happened to coincide with the uh, owner of the uh, agency, uh, Leonard Armato, signing Shaquille O'Neal. Oh. So, I, so I ended up working on a lot of things and getting a lot of experience. I never thought, thought I would because I would be kind of a jack-of-all-trades. I'd worked with mm -hmm. Leonard on basketball clients. I would uh, do some marketing things, and I would work with Gary on um, football guys. It turned out that Leonard was most interested in maximizing Shaquille, because mm -hmm. I thought I was going to be more of a basketball agent than a football agent. Instead of doing what David Falk did, which was use Michael Jordan as a vehicle for other clients. Yep. The whole maximizing Shaquille aspect, I would work on some Shaquille stuff, but ended up gravitating towards football, always worked very closely with Gary. And then after, I think it was like maybe four years, we formed Premier Sports and Entertainment, which mm -hmm. is a company that still exists, and took all the football clients. The interesting thing is something that doesn't happen. It was an extremely amicable split where we still shared office space with Leonard, and I served as a consultant for Leonard for several years on Shaquille Matters. Mm -hmm. So that, I would say if you ask me who are the most influential people to get me into the industry, one, Steve Darian for recommending me, two, Gary Uberstein because I learned the most for, from him, from working uh, more closely with him, and three, Leonard Amato for giving me an opportunity to work at his company. Beautiful. And that was uh, Management Plus Enterprises? Yes, Management Plus Enterprises. All right, boom. Now – you were dealing with Shaq. Was this around the Kazam time? Uh, yeah, it was all through, uh, I'd say, the first 10 years of his career. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, so, 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 so it was a part of the Kazam time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's always a funny story. Uh, 
believe it or not, most people don't realize that his first album went mm-hmm. platinum. <laughs> but I think being a rapping genie doesn't necessarily do wonders for your music career. <laughs> uh, it it, it might have started out as a good idea at the time, but I, I, I don't know, man. I was, a, I was a kid when that came out, and I don't know, just, just didn't really strike a chord. No, it didn't really strike a chord with me either, but <laughs> it, at the time, you know, people forget how big Shaq was from a marketing standpoint back then. He was number mm-hmm. two to Michael Jordan, and their demographics are a little bit different. Uh, young kids really were into Shaq, whereas you had teenagers who were really into Michael Jordan back then. So it was two really competing demographics. But, no, I don't think anyone's ever going to approach Michael Jordan from a marketing and endorsement standpoint because the guy's been retired for over 15 years. And if you have, like, uh, Q scores or name uh, recognizability among athletes, he's still right up there, which is amazing. Uh, the man could sell ice to Eskimos. Oh, no doubt. <laughs> uh, all right, so you moved on to Premier Sports Entertainment, focusing more on NFL. Uh, who is the toughest – negotiator you ever had to deal with during that time well i'll give you the i don't know if it's necessarily toughest but my least enjoyable experience because it ended up being a tough negotiation the guy's no longer in the industry Mm -hmm. but uh terry o'neill was the team negotiator uh for the new orleans saints um he used to be a tv executive i think he was brought in from mike ditka Mm -hmm. i had the misfortune of dealing with him shortly after the he did the Ricky Williams deal, oh. where Ricky Williams signed an incentive-laden rookie contract, which basically required him to be the best running back in NFL history to earn most of the incentives. Uh, no limit sports um, management. Exactly. <laughs> and, and the way a lot, a lot of times we worked uh, was we do things jointly, good cop, bad cop. Mm-hmm. But in this particular negotiation, um, I – got left with the task of dealing with uh, Terry because he was hard to deal with. And some of the proposals that he would make, um, it was for Sammy Knight, who was um, an undrafted free agent um, safety out of USC that started Mm -hmm. early on and became a pro bowler. And we were doing this deal when he was still an exclusive rights guy. So they had leverage um, more so than we did, but Mm – They wanted to do something um, because the idea was to lock up a good young player who's the core of the team early because you'll get a better deal than if you wait. But Terry back then would sometimes outsmart himself of how he would do deals because he had a lot of escalators and incentives in deals with objective measures. But he would set thresholds ridiculously high. Mm -hmm. So I would – go back and look, take his thresholds and check, okay, what have safeties done recently? And I'm like, this is like, you're asking him to be the best safety in football. If he's going to do this, then we need to start talking about whole different numbers. So it was always a chore getting from point A to point B with that deal. So that was my least enjoyable experience in getting a contract done because it actually turned into like a two, three-day holdout from mm-hmm. training camp. And um, wasn't under under contract then. <laughs> now, in your experience, do players prefer to have uh, a little less money but fewer escalators, or do they like having the escalators put in? I they don't want the escalators. They'd rather have guaranteed money and hard mm-hmm. dollars. That um, bird in the hand sort I, of deal. Yeah, it's worked two in the bush. I always view escalators and incentives as a way to bridge a fundamental disagreement on value. <laughs> Mm-hmm. and not something that I would look to really want in the contract, but only if it, if it was something that was going to get me from point A to point B to bridge the gap in a deal. Or if you have a guy that's coming off an injury and you're doing a one-year prove-it deal, mm-hmm. since the way the cap salary cap works, anything you didn't do the year before from an incentive standpoint, from a performance standpoint, would be considered not likely to be earned incentive and wouldn't initially count on the salary cap. It didn't reconcile at the end of the year. But that's a way where you could have additional compensation for your, your client, which wouldn't count on the cap for the team initially. And in that situation, incentives make more sense. 
Uh, just a tangent off real quick. We brought up the ill-fated No Limit Sports Management, and the the big one right now is Rock Nation Sports. I think they've got like Indomitian and Sue, Geno Smith, Des Bryant. Uh, what's your take on uh, them coming up? Well, they are a force to be reckoned with because mm-hmm. one of the things they have going for them that No Limit Sports didn't is, one, they don't have any type of contract they can do that's going to torpedo them because the NFL has a rookie wage scale mm-hmm. for uh, draft pick salaries, which makes it almost idiot-proof to do a deal. You could take a reasonably intelligent 15-year-old, explain the system to him, and he could get the same rookie deal as Tom Condon or Drew Rosenhaus or whatever age that you want to name. Mm-hmm. But um, one thing, and you saw it with Kevin uh, Durant, that one of the reasons he went with uh, Rock Nation is these guys idolized Jay Z. He's someone mm-hmm. that they look up to. That's something that didn't exist with Master P in, in No Limit Sports, that it's not the same. So they've made the agent community very nervous mm-hmm. in terms of their ability to sign high profile clients, even though right now they're doing the uh, deals jointly with CAA yep. <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, the contracts. I expect that to change over time. Um, they recently hired an in-house agent, um, Ari Nissim, who used to uh, work, was an executive for the Jets. So that's, a, to me, a strong indicator they're moving in that direction. Mm-hmm. They're going to be more self-sufficient, so I think that's a very good hire on their part. Uh, the one thing that we've seen over time is a lot of um, entertainers have tried to get into the uh, – agency business and it failed because I remember being at the uh, Final Four in 1993 in New Orleans and MC Hammer and Spike Lee were trying to be agents at that time. Oh, poor Uh, MC Hammer. Yeah, it didn't pan out for them. Um, There was a time when I think P. Diddy was trying to recruit um, Charles Woodson in conjunction with uh, Lamont Smith, who was a pretty prominent agent in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And probably the... uh, most successful venture has been Jermaine Dupree's So So Deaf Sports with a prompt with a uh, established agent Hadley Engelhart. Mm-hmm. Now, to me, the true test of the marketing acumen of Rock Nation, because it's not that hard to market Kevin Durant, is are they going to do something which is significant or special for Skylar Diggins? Mm-hmm. Since the WNBA, in terms of public consciousness and recognizability is fairly low on the sports totem pole. Uh, what would you say is the biggest misconception that fans have about uh, contracts and then like the mythical NFL salary cap? Well, I'll answer it two ways. Uh, the first misconception they have is about agent fees. That You hear people say, oh, I'll take that 10%. Uh, no agent gets 10% on a player's contract because fees are governed by players' associations. Mm-hmm. And in the NBA, the maximum fee you can charge is 4%. In the NFL, it's 3%. Mm-hmm. They have major league baseball, there is no fee maximum, but the industry settles the maximum is really about 5%. So that that's the first misconception. And then... A lot of people say, if I had that type of money, then um, I'd be set for life. Well, one thing you don't realize is that a lot of a, a lot of the players end up taking care of family members, friends. People come out the the woodwork asking for money. Oh yeah. And sometimes players have a hard time saying no. Mm-hmm. And then the one thing a lot of players don't don't realize is how much they're going to have to pay in taxes. Because if you've never had money before, you really had no reason to know about taxes, and they're kind of surprised Mm -hmm. at their first paycheck. Because the thing that the general public doesn't realize is that for most people, the peak earning years are later in life. It's not in their 20s. And for for athletes, uh, the clear majority, this money is going to be the most money they make in their lifetime, and it's supposed to either give them a great head start for them finding a second career or to last them a lifetime. So that's one thing I don't think people really understand, that athletes sometimes aren't the best equipped to go on to do something else, either from an educational standpoint, to don't find anything that interests them or is as challenging. 
and yeah. they're not usually in their 40s, 50s, early 60s. They're not going to be making the most money uh, of a lifetime. Yeah, I just remember that uh, ESPN 30 for 30 broke, and some of the stories those guys had, it's just uh, you, you feel so bad for them uh, a little bit. Well, one thing that you've seen, and it's going to happen over time, it's not going to go away, that there's always going to be some financial advisor mm-hmm. which ends up squandering players' money. Um, it's a recurring theme, and you even see it with people who aren't in athletics with the whole Bernie Madoff uh, fiasco. So it, people always demonize agents. Mm-hmm. in terms of them being about as bad as lawyers. You know the old joke, what, what's, uh, think, I think it's like, uh, I forget what it was about, uh, what's the, what, what's the uh, 10 attorneys at the bottom of the ocean? A good start. That's good how start, people yeah. engage. <laughs> uh, but really, financial advisors and now memorabilia brokers are the biggest threat to college player eligibility. Mm-hmm. But the, uh, financial advisors aren't regulated by states the same way uh, agents are. And that's starting to change because I think George is going to include financial advisors and also get started starting to come after memorabilia dealers. I think that specifically relates to uh, Todd Gurley if uh, players in that state's uh, eligibility is jeopardized um, while they're still playing for college. Yeah, what's your take on that, memorabilia dealers being predators and then flipping on Todd Gurley and then also Jameis and Johnny Manziel have been involved with it previously? Well, I think the NCAA is behind the times. I, mm-hmm. I've never understood why a player can't profit off of his uh, name and likeness. I know they like to cloak everything under the uh, term amateurism, but there was a time uh, before my time, really, uh, that if you were in track and field and other, and other sports, you couldn't be a professional. You could not get paid if you wanted to be in the Olympics. I think that the NCAA needs to evolve, and it's going to happen uh, hopefully through the litigation like the O'Bannon case they lost mm-hmm. or the NCAA doing something they ever do, taking a lightning approach and allowing kids to profit off of this directly, <laughs> off of the name and likeness, because it doesn't make sense. Because everyone knows that a number two jersey at Texas A&M was for Johnny Manziel. Even if his name's <laughs> not on the back. You're buying the jersey for that reason. You're not buying it because I love Texas A&M. Who was buying the Texas A&M number two jersey before he got there? Nobody. I don't even know who wore it. So I'd like to see that either go to them directly, get put in a trust, or or where they can access some portion of it now and some later. But I think the NCAA needs to revamp its rules in order to get more in line with the times. Yeah, I agree that. I equate the NCAA to FIFA a lot, where it's just a, a corrupt, arcane governing body governing over a beautiful sport that everyone loves and can't get enough of. Well, that's a pretty good analogy. Mm. There you go. Uh, all right, Joel, uh, we had get off the field, so we got three and out, which is a list of three quick-fire questions to bring us on home. Uh, the first one is, uh, who is the most influential in your career? And I know you pointed out earlier, like Steve Darian, uh, Uberstein, uh, Leonard Almada, but uh, who else has helped you along the way? Um, actually, someone who's really helped me from the uh, NFL side, from the uh, executive side, is the uh, former Cowboys executive, Gil Brandt. He's been someone that I've uh, yeah developed a really good relationship over the years and really mm-hmm. treasured his friendship. Yep, he is uh, a great follow on Twitter. He always puts out just great nuggets of information out there. Oh yes, he does. Yep. Uh, what's one piece of advice that you give someone who would want to follow in your footsteps? Be persistent, because if you want to get in the eight, if you want to become a sports agent, it's a highly competitive industry, and you better be very persistent and do a lot of networking to try to expand your contacts in order to get in the industry. Because And also be creative, think outside of the box to try to find a way in the industry because just getting your foot in the door in the industry, maybe it's from marketing or PR for team, that can help you segue to becoming a sports agent because I know there are people who've done that as well. Uh, one thing that... I would suggest, and didn't exist when I was around, there's a company called Sports Management Worldwide, which uh, offers a, a lot of online education 
for sports business program, sports business training. I'm actually uh, one of the mentors um, for their athlete management uh, class they have, which introduces people to being a sports agent. They have other classes like on football, um, scouting, and GM that were marked dominant. Uh, the former Tampa Bay GM mm-hmm. is the uh, mentor, and Dan Evans, the former Dodgers uh, general manager, is the baseball scouting and GM course um, mentor. I would take a course like that because I didn't know what the um, being a sports agent really entailed because back in the late um, 90s, you didn't have the, the Internet or the way to find out other information. So there are things in the business I didn't expect. So I would take a course like this just to make sure once you learn more about it that it's something you really want to do because mm-hmm. there are outlets like that. Available. Also, um, college uh, kids can get, credit at the university for select universities for taking a course like this. Oh, very cool. Uh, at sportsmanagerworldwide.com, and that will be included on uh, the show page as well. Uh, and then last one for you, Joel, a book recommendation, football, life, or otherwise, what you got? Well, there's a book that I read a couple of years ago. It was kind of intriguing me. It was uh, Malcolm Gladwell's um, Outliers because of that mm-hmm. whole 10,000-hour rule concept. I'm not necessarily sure if I agree with it um, wholeheartedly because he kind of takes the approach that uh, practice makes perfect. Mm-hmm. I just remember from playing basketball, coaches saying practice makes permanent. So <laughs> if you're practicing a bad habit, <laughs> you're going to permanently make that bad habit. But I, I get the general general concept, but – there's some people that have a predisposition towards certain things, and no matter how hard they practice or how many hours they put in, they're not going to be able to go as far as someone else. But I get the mm-hmm. whole general concept that you got to work really hard at something and to put in an inordinate amount of time to become an expert or master something. So from that standpoint, I really like the like the rule, even if I don't necessarily totally buy into it. So what you're saying as uh... – Myself as a 29 year old, five foot eight on a good day person. If I work 10,000 hours to be the best big man in the NBA, it's not going to work out. That's true. You just there's just some yeah. things you can't overcome genetically. Dang, dang it! <laughs> All right, Joel. So what's your end game? Uh, what are you going to be doing in 10 years? Still writing the call, capology? What are you going to do? I really don't know. Uh, that's one thing I thought about trying to transition into was going from the agent side to the team side. That's a very hard transition mm-hmm. because there may be 45 cap jobs available because not every team has two people doing that, and the turnover isn't all that great. Because <laughs> that's that's actually was one of the reasons I started doing the writing because um, I got introduced to Joe Fortenbaugh, who was one of the um, – editors at National Football Post. Andy Brandt was kind of transitioning out from um, working there, uh, doing a lot of uh, writing there. And I kind of made mention that I thought Calvin Johnson had ridiculous leverage Mm -hmm. in 2012 before he uh, signed his contract extension. And Joe was like, we're looking for content all the time, so if you want to write something and um, submit it. So I wasn't really doing anything with my knowledge then submitted it. They liked it, and, it was, and the thing kind of grew from there, and we got the interest from CBS. So I think I've, I'm trying to develop a niche as being the leading expert in terms of salary cap contract stuff and want to try to transition that into other forms of media. That, that's the uh, short-term goal. Oh, very cool. Uh, all right, just wrapping up, uh, how can people contact, interact with you, read your stuff? Well, you can find me um, weekly at National Football Post and regularly at um, CBSSports.com, uh, and I can be found on Twitter at Corey Joel, that's C-O-R-R-Y-J-O-E-L. Uh, not Joel, Corey, as we established early on. No, I wish I could have gotten that one, but wasn't available, surprisingly. All, right. uh, all, all this info will be available on our Football Convos page. But, Joel, uh, it was great talk to you, and thank you for coming on Football Convos. It was a pleasure. Oh, thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to Football Convos. For more daily football conversations, visit footballconvos.com or visit us at iTunes.